An explosive new documentary set to air on HBO is reigniting claims that Michael Jackson sexually abused children. You dated Wade Robson, one of the accusers, in Leaving Neverland for over seven years, is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay. Neverland was unbelievable. I have literally been in every corner, every closet. I mean, there was that level of trust. They've repeatedly changed their stories and the evidence overwhelmingly undermines it. You know, he took the easy way. It makes sense. If I go through with this, I win big time. I will get everything I want. They will be destroyed forever. This just gets wilder every single day. I will take anybody down that harms a child. The year was 1993. Michael Jackson was in the middle of his biggest world tour yet, the Dangerous World Tour. He was on top of the world, both musically and professionally. His album sales were through the roof, he had just signed a multi-million dollar publicity deal with Pepsi, and he owned one of the world's largest music catalogues, ATV Music, which famously included the Beatles. All of this, and then... Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. The pop star is accused of abusing a 13-year-old boy. A 13-year-old boy is accusing the singer of sexual molestation. This man is going to be humiliated beyond belief. He will not believe it. He will not believe what's going to happen. Beyond his, beyond his worst nightmares, sell one more record. If I go through with this, I win big time. I will get everything I want. They will be destroyed forever. There have been many disgusting statements made recently concerning allegations of improper conduct on my part. These statements about me are totally false. I had been the target of an extortion attempt. Now I've seen people say that because a settlement was reached in the Jordan Chandler case, that's a, a sign of Michael's guilt. What are your thoughts on that? The money that was paid out to Jordy Chandler didn't come from Michael Jackson, it came from his insurance company. Have you ever had a car accident? You say, but it wasn't my fault. The insurance course. company doesn't give a shit. They make a decision and they do what they want to do. And everybody's going, but if, if he didn't do this, why is he paying this guy $20 million or the family $20 million? He didn't do it. The insurance company did it. By this time in his career, Michael was no stranger to lawsuits. And unfortunately for many celebrities, lawsuits and scandals are a part of life whether the accusations are legitimate or not. I get sued probably 15 times a year. I have lawyers on a monthly retainer just because you get sued so much when you're, when you're famous. It may be the most famous star in the world, he's certainly one of the richest, and that makes Michael Jackson a prime target for lawsuits. Denver singer-songwriter Crystal Cartier is suing Jackson, claiming she wrote Dangerous in 1985. Another day, another lawsuit for Michael Jackson. This time, his former spokeswoman says she's suing the pop star for $44 million. I believe I am Annie from Smooth Criminal. Michael Jackson's alleged son has just gone public. Why do you think... Michael was such a repeated target for, for lawsuits. When you have a certain niceness, people take advantage of it. Okay. Can you grab me? Okay. How are you doing? Sheriff's Department, do you have a search warrant? Who else is here? Just you? We, the jury in the above entitled case, find the defendant not guilty of lewd act upon a minor child. An explosive new documentary set to air on HBO is reigniting claims that Michael Jackson sexually abused children. Wade Robson and James Safechuck accuse the pop icon of molesting them when they were young boys. I know this must be a hard time. Yes, Um Because there aren't that many people uh, that know someone quite as well as their ex-partner. Um, you dated Wade Robson, one of the accusers, in Leaving Neverland for over seven years, is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay. Um, how did you guys first get together? Uh, I met him approximately in 1991. Mm -hmm. And you were how old? Uh, maybe around nine, ten years old. Cool. We met at a photo shoot with my uncle Michael. Everything went really well, we all hung out together, we were friends, you know, becoming friends I should say. And then Next thing I knew, 
Um, he had asked my Uncle Michael if he could get to know me better. He had started to develop a little crush. He asked my Uncle Michael if he would arrange a situation where we could get to know each other better. So my uncle did that. He had us uh, both meet at the ranch. Uh, Wade's family was there, his mother, his sister, himself. I was there with my brother. We were there for about a week, um, just getting to know each other. And towards the end of that trip, he very sweetly turned to me and asked, would you be my girlfriend? Um, and of course, you know, we had gotten along so well, I said yes. And that started then and last for seven plus? Seven plus years. Seven yeah. plus years. We had about a 10 year friendship relationship. It's just um, hard to pinpoint the exact so seven the exact plus time. years. So yeah. it's, it started as, a, as, a, as a, I guess, a, a young, innocent thing, but then by the end of it, you were in your late teens. Absolutely. So it was, yeah. by all means, you know, a real relationship Absolutely. by the end of it. Yeah. Um, during your time with Wade, what was he like as as a boyfriend? You know, uh, in the beginning of our relationship, um, or I should, let me rephrase this, throughout the entire relationship, we were very good friends. Um, everything was very normal, very supportive of one another. We were very close. Uh, he was always either at my house or I was at his house. Our families were friends. His mother was friends with my mother. And this went on for years. Everything was fine until he became about 17, 18 years old and I started to see his behavior change. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when he started to cheat. So, and when you're with someone so long and you're so close to them, you understand that something is changing. Mm -hmm. There's a difference in behavior. Uh, and as I would confront him about these things, he would say, no, these aren't true. I, I'm just, I'm working on this project or I'm doing this, but constantly lying. That was something I was gonna say. Did he ever bring up any infidelities with you? Yeah, no, he denied them. Uh, and there's, a woman's intuition, you know when something is going on, but I had trust and faith in him and I believed As you should, he was said. your boyfriend. Absolutely, you know. yeah, and best friend. You tweeted that you found out that Wade cheated on you with multiple women who he hoped uh, would advance his career. Um, you also say, you may know one of them because it was a huge pop music scandal. Yeah. We have to say allegedly here, the alleged situation was that he cheated on you with Britney Spears when he was working with her, the slave, yes. slave for you Britney days. Yes, exactly. Um, which then resulted in her relationship with Justin Timberlake um, ending. Was that the, the end? Was that the cutoff moment there? Yes, but that was also one of the situations where I felt something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. um, and I was confronting him about that, one of those in particular. Um, which he continued to deny and then somebody very close to me who was also close to him was able to tell me no these things are true and it's not just this one he's sleeping with this person and this person and this person and when I spoke to a few of these other women I found out that these were in fact true and and these women were people as you say who he thought would advance his career Absolutely. help advance his Absolutely. career it's interesting because because a note was found um, and confirmed to be written by Wade that stated this, and I quote, my story of abuse and its effects will make me relatable slash relevant. Right. The last sentence of that note said, it's time for me to get mine. When questioned and asked what he meant by that last sentence, he said he didn't know and he didn't remember. What do you think he meant by it's time for me to get mine? I think he meant just what he's doing now. Um, he has always been a bit of an opportunist um, and he kind of, he, he gets it, I'm going to say, I feel comfortable saying this, he gets this from his mother and he knows how to position himself into di different situations that will benefit him in a financial way. Mm -hmm. um, so once he had nothing else to climb for, once he was being taken off of the Cirque du Soleil show and other jobs weren't coming through, this was his this next is, outlet right. and this is what he means by he will get what he deserves or he will get his. And it's interesting um, that you say that came from his mother because uh, of course the story goes that um, Michael first met Wade in Australia in, right. in the late 80s. He won a competition to meet Michael and then they lost contact for a little while and it was his mother that was trying to get, Absolutely. you know, get back to Michael and then eventually you know, it happened and he, he invited them over and, and, and they met again. Absolutely. Now your relationship with Wade isn't mentioned in the film. I'm not surprised. Why do you think that is? It, it completely discredits what he's saying. He's saying that he was in a relationship with my uncle, that they were in love and that they were having um, a relationship, if you will. He's saying that my uncle kept him from women, which is not true. We, we were just talking about how my uncle put us together. It would discount or discredit the things that he's trying to claim. And I, I find it fascinating that he thinks it's, he's able to just erase 10 years of his life. Yeah, yeah. What would you, I guess, say to Wade 
now if you had the opportunity to, to, to chat to him? I would confront him about his lies. I would, I would tell him to stop lying. I wouldn't, I, I'm not curious as to why he's doing it. He needs to stop. I don't care what his reasoning is as far as trying to be relevant, um, desperate for money, whatever it is, these lies need to stop and it's not okay. So this, this man, my uncle took care of him and did very well by him and his family. Mm. And he knows that. I've got Brad Sundberg uh, on the phone with me now. He worked with Michael across an 18 year span as his technical director, both on his albums and in personal projects, including uh, Neverland Valley Ranch. He currently is running a traveling seminar called In the Studio with MJ. Brad, in Wade's lawsuit against the Jackson estate, he mentions that some of the abuse took place at a recording studio named Record One. He said Michael had a sort of green room and that the abuse went on in there. Now you were at the studio every day with Michael. What are your thoughts on these claims? Um. Well, Michael did have what we call the private lounge. Um, you know, whenever you work with an artist of any magnitude, you know, they, they usually have a lounge um, where they can go and take a meeting, grab a phone call, grab a nap, watch TV, whatever they want to do. The studio was very closed. Um, nobody came into the studio really without the reason for being there. So it wasn't like Michael had guests there every day. I mean, the guests were actually pretty infrequent the perception that michael always had kids there kids and chimps and you know clowns juggling bowling pins just there there's there's really no validity to that we were working so you don't believe any of the claims that the abuse happened in the studio <sighs> you know let, let me let me pull you back and do a bit of a big picture number one i'm a dad um at that point i had two daughters. I've worked with kids in my church for years. I'm very aware of kids. Not in a million years did I ever see a child around Michael Jackson that looked like they had been distressed, hurt, abused. I can't, you know, put my hand on a Bible and say, absolutely nothing happened in that room. It's just, there weren't that many instances. I mean, I remember seeing Wade once or twice at the studio. It was not a regular occurrence at all. And there just, there wasn't a sense of wrongdoing or, oh my goodness, what's going on? Brad, you played a, a very large part in Michael's vision that was Neverland Valley Ranch. Michael brought you in to design the music and video systems throughout the ranch. There aren't that many people that got to see, I guess, Neverland as thoroughly as you did. So these rumours of, you know, Neverland being some sort of house of horrors um, and a place to lure children, what are your thoughts on that? If you hear a chuckle in my voice, it's just out of sheer frustration. Um, Neverland was unbelievable. It, it was such a peaceful, safe, fun place designed very specifically for kids that that were you know underprivileged or burn victims or you know sick kids make a wish kids yes i have literally been in every corner every closet you know i, I kind of joke with people good naturedly that I've, I've, I've literally been under michael jackson's bed you know just pulling just pulling speaker wires i mean there was that level of trust you know, was there a lock on Michael's bedroom? Yeah, it's his bedroom. I have a lock on my bedroom. If I was there to work, it's not like there were people telling me, oh, Brad, you can't open that drawer, you can't open that closet, you can't go. There was none of that. There was nothing that even hinted at, oh, wow, what what is this guy into? Right. At Michael's, it was, you know, it was Shirley Temple and uh, Disney music. And it really was. That's what the guy dug. Brad, now I read that you helped put a youth worker in prison after you learned that they were harming children. If you had any suspicions of Michael, would you have, I guess, reacted the same way? Yeah, I was in a completely different situation where somebody that I knew and somebody that I was close with actually was harming children. And I immediately, for lack of a better word, uh, turned on that gentleman. And it's not something I dwell on, not something I talk about very much. 
but when somebody wants to throw it in my face that well Brad's just protecting his friend or whatever no that's not how I'm wired I will take anybody down that harms a child So I'm talking to Scott Ross, who was one of Hollywood's top private investigators. He was the private investigator for the defense in the Michael Jackson trial in 2005. Did you ever find anything uh, during your time working on the trial uh, for the defense when you thought, hang on, maybe I'm on the wrong team here? Nope. Nope. And that segues into the real meat of the question. If I truly, for one tenth of one second, believe that Wade Robson was telling the truth, he wouldn't have been my first witness. The reason that we put him on first is because he was our strongest witness. He was the most credible. He was the most believable. When the prosecution goes, they go first. So when you call your first witness, the prosecution has already put on their case. They have, in their mind, have already hammered away at the jury board. Guilty, 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 guilty. So by the time you get your turn, the time you get your bite at the apple, the first thing you want to do is put on your strongest witness because the jury sits there and they listen to your witness. If you get a strong witness, the first thing they're going to think is, oh, wait a minute, okay, it's not so cut and dry. Let's hear what else they have to say. Hmm. That's why you always, always, always start with your strongest witness. In our case, that was Wade Robson. Wade Robson had to get through three seasoned, experienced, intelligent attorneys. How is it? That when those three attorneys, this was not a surprise pack, those three attorneys, those very seasoned, experienced three attorneys with cross-examination history under their belt, prosecutors, got together the night before, prepared their attack. How are they not able to break Wade Robson? If you're trying to hide the truth, you're going to waver, you're going to do whatever. They went hard on Wade, a lot harder than they did on Macaulay, and a lot harder than they did on Brett Barnes, and simply because he was the first. And the reason he didn't change his story is because he was telling the truth. There's nothing to change. In Leaving Neverland, uh, James Safechuck tells a story where Michael had asked him to testify. Um, he says he refused, which led Michael to get angry and they never spoke again. Do you recall that situation? Do you recall uh, James being asked to testify? Jimmy Safechuck was never an issue during the trial. We did no work on him. We did no preparation on him. He was not an issue. He was never, ever, ever going to testify. The court was never, ever going to allow him to testify. The court, Judge Melville, took him out of the mix long before the trial started. Bottom line is Jimmy Stakechuck was never, ever going to talk to anybody. So whatever all of this nonsense is about, it's about personal greed. Now, from my research and understanding mm -hmm. of, of, of Michael, um, it appears that he, he surrounded himself with, with children because they saw a friend. Mm -hmm. Adults saw yeah. dollar signs. What opportunities. You, opportunities. Yeah. What do you think his mindset towards surrounding himself with children? Was it exactly that? You know, he, he, he saw people that weren't going to take advantage, screw him over. It was beyond that. It was living vicariously through people. He mm -hmm. didn't have a childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in studio all the time, you know. Um, he would ask us, me and my brothers, he would say, um, when we would talk to him about a birthday party, he would, he would be so intrigued, he'd be like, what was it like, you wow. know? Now I want to talk about something that's mentioned in, in, in the film, mm -hmm. Leaving Neverland. Uh, they mention love faxes yeah. uh, from Michael. Um, I've got what the notes say here. Yeah. Uh, one of the faxes, the love faxes say, Hello, doo-doo. You are the best of the kid dancers. Keep on towards perfection. You are now inspiring me to get better. Mm -hmm. Another one of the faxes says, Make me happy, little one, mm -hmm. and be the best. I love you. Mm -hmm. Now, as someone who knew Michael, as you say, yeah. so well, mm -hmm. Do these notes sound like him grooming this family? No, no. Um, and there's hundreds of, oh, well, I wouldn't say hundreds, but there's tens and tens of us that have these notes. They're you've, similar. You've, you've got some, we've got yeah, some of the my, notes here. I have these, my brothers have these, you know. You know, he was like that. If, if he thought his words could help you or inspire you, he would write you a letter. There's this note here. Um, that where he says Uncle Duda, he calls himself Uncle Duda, of yeah, course. Yeah, he's called himself Uncle Duda to us a lot. Yeah. In this note, he's calling Wade Duda. Duda. Yeah. Um, it's I'm nothing saying, uncommon about right. it, but in the wrong context. And when it's sinister context, 
people that don't know him or that gotcha. don't know the context of it will look at it and be like, well, that's weird. This one says, please rehearse. Yeah. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Yeah, so I love you all, yeah. These are just really notes of encouragement. Yeah, he has, there's, uh, I have a poster that he wrote, you know, you are the world and the world is yours, mm -hmm. you know. He was like that. He yeah. was like that. And that's, I think, the magic of him too. He was always wanting you to be the best person you could be. I want to talk about uh, a situation that happened between Wade and a Cirque du Soleil show. Of mm -hmm. course, there's a Cirque du Soleil show in Vegas. Now, in May 2011, mm -hmm. a couple of years before the show premiered, Wade sent an email to the creative team at Cirque um, stating, and I quote, I always wanted to do this MJ show badly. He then goes on in this email to say, I know that I am meant to do this show. I am passionate to do this show. I want to make it amazing for me, for you, for Cirque, and of course, for Michael. Mm -hmm. The gig ended up going to you know, Jamie, Jamie King. King. Jamie King, yes. So obviously he didn't get the gig. I want to read a timeline. I've got a timeline here. Oh, nice. Okay. May 2011, sent that email asking for the gig. July 2011, interview, he stated that he was starting on mm -hmm. the show. I'm starting on uh, Cirque du Soleil, Michael Jackson show, which is... Uh, you know, exciting and terrifying all at the same time because it's such a huge uh, responsibility. Sometime after that, Jamie King got the gig. Mm -hmm. Late 2012, Wade starts drafting a book about the alleged abuse, no publisher picks it up. 1st of May 2013, Wade files a civil lawsuit against the Michael estate mm -hmm. for monetary compensation with claims of childhood sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. 16th of May 2013, Wade goes public with the allegations on television. A week later, May 23rd, 2013, Michael Jackson 1, Cirque du Soleil starts. Mm -hmm. It seems a little bit, you know, it seems a little when bit. When you lay it out, When yeah. you lay it out like that. People, you know, it, you need to lay it out like that to right. people, otherwise they don't see it. They, they don't, don't see the motivation it. of why he's doing certain things. And of course, in between there, there was Julian's Auctions, With who 2011, have, yeah. in 2011, yeah. who have tweeted yeah. that Wade wanted to stay anonymous. Yes. Um, he was selling some of his most, I guess, prized mm -hmm. possessions. So it seems like during this time, and Wade has said that during this time, he was having a, a mental breakdown, but it seems like a bit of a financial crisis yes. as well. You know, he took the easy way. Are there any other times post Michael passing, mm -hmm. where he asked to be part of a Jackson project? Um, well, the, there is the memorial. The memorial. Yeah, the memorial was the first time. After that, Wade wanted to see the kids again. And so I made that happen. And um, it's it feels like a betrayal because especially, I wish I could take it back. No, he was very thankful when it happened, you know, and Joy even said at Havenhurst, you know, my biggest fear is to lose contact with the family wow. you know and that to me it says it all it says it all like once they lost contact once that cert job ended that was like the official you're cut off right and it's almost like a disgruntled employee right i'm gonna hurt you now when was the last time you you saw either wade or the robson family you mentioned the memorial but post yeah. that Post that, um, I would see them, I would see the Robson family often because we have a mutual friend. We have a very close mutual friend. And so every Christmas I would see Chantel and Joy. Uh, this was the first time this uh, past year, the um, 2018 Christmas, that I, I was arriving with my wife and my at a, baby. At a Christmas party? At a Christmas party and she was leaving. Joy. Uh, no, uh, Chantel. Chantel, the sister. Was, was, okay. was leaving and with her, I think it's her husband. Mm -hmm. um, and she had her head down and when I said when I said hi to her and it told me a lot it didn't tell me a lot back then because I was just like that's odd yeah you're you know we've right. always been somewhat cordial yeah. but now knowing the situation it makes sense did you ever post 2013 say to anyone in the family this, that was that was odd that you know Wade is saying this now no um I had I've talked to people that were around them or, or um, friends of them and Everyone has been somewhat trying to be supportive to Wade because they were friends with him, okay. but at the same time, didn't believe him, or at least 100% didn't believe him. That's where it's, you know, and I've, met, I've made that statement in many interviews that, you know, if this is about Wade and James Safechuck, you know, and it's about their journey and their discovery and whatever they want to say, it's like, the reason they don't have a best friend that they interviewed is because a best friend probably didn't want to be on camera. 
Charles Thompson is on the phone right now. He's a crime journalist and investigative reporter who is based in the UK. He's been studying the Jackson case for many years now. Charles, some of Michael's fans have been quick to find some inconsistencies uh, within these guys' stories. Can you share some of those with me? Yeah, well, of course, the the glaring inconsistency to begin with is that both of them have previously testified in Michael Jackson's favour. Then you look into the history of their allegations since they came forward, and they've repeatedly changed their stories since then. Wade Robson gives various conflicting stories as to why he testified in 2005, beginning with, I didn't realise that I'd been abused, and then changing into did realise I'd been abused, but um, I didn't want to be responsible for sending him to prison. And then evolving into, I did realise that that I'd been abused, but I was bullied and forced into testifying by Michael Jackson's lawyers. His story keeps changing. That's nothing to do with childhood trauma. That's a very recent event that happened when he was an adult, and he still can't get his story straight. I think the most important thing for people to know, the film starts off uh, quite convincingly by presenting the viewer with a lot of evidence that substantiates the early part of the story about meeting Michael Jackson, about hanging out with him for the first time. They're playing home movies, they're showing you photographs. And so they're luring you in and getting you to believe in these guys' narrative by showing you evidence that corroborates that, yes, they did meet and know Michael Jackson. But then as soon as it departs and takes a dark turn and starts talking about abuse, what you notice is all of the evidence just disappears. Uh, For instance, when they start talking about going to Neverland and having sleepovers, there is no evidence of this. And you have to go to the court documents to find the evidence which either corroborates or undermines these allegations, and the evidence overwhelmingly undermines it. I've also seen some claims uh, that James Safechuck stories have been copied from, from a book. Can you confirm that? Is there any truth to that? Well, it's a matter of interpretation. So the, there's a guy called Victor Gutierrez. Uh, in the 90s, he published a book which was called Michael Jackson Was My Lover, and which said on the cover that it was based on the secret diary of Geordie Chandler. It's basically, it's almost like a Fifty Shades of Grey for paedophiles. It's like a piece of erotic literature um, about Michael Jackson supposedly having sex many, many times with Geordie Chandler. And many of the details from that book are very similar to details from James Safechuck's allegations, even though that book was completely dismissed by the Chandler family who said it was a work of fiction and that they had nothing to do with it. Uh, So it is suspicious. I don't think it's substantiated. I wouldn't stake my reputation on it and and go as far as to say that Safechuck has copied the book, but there are notable similarities. So here are some of the similarities between James Safechuck's lawsuit and this book. Pages 57 and 58 of the book mentions Michael rented movies with historic and foreign themes that featured minors participating in lewd acts. Safe Chuck's lawsuit paragraph 60 says that Michael showed him foreign books and movies that featured minors engaging in the same lewd acts mentioned in the book. Another similarity, page 40 of the book says that Jackson was jealous of a girl that Jordan Chandler liked. Paragraph 39 of Safe Chuck's lawsuit says Jackson was jealous of Safe Chuck's crush on Cheryl Crow, who was Michael's backup singer at the time. Pages 37 and 38 of the book says that when going to sleep with Michael, Jordan Chandler noticed that Michael put a bandage over his nose to hold it in place. Safe Chuck's lawsuit paragraph 24 says before going to sleep, Safe Chuck noticed Michael used a bandage to cover his nose. In the book, page 80, it says Michael made the children drink alcohol. In Safe Chuck's lawsuit paragraph 60, it says Michael made Safe Chuck drink alcohol. Book pages 21 and 22, it says that Jordan Chandler was jealous of Brett Barnes, who was Michael Jackson's friend at the time, who to this day says that nothing happened between them. In Safe Chuck's lawsuit, paragraph 62, Safe Chuck was jealous of Brett Barnes. Now, those are just a few of the similarities there. There are a few more, but due to the graphic nature of them, I'm not going to be sharing them. Obviously, this is all alleged. But it's hard to deny um, that this book shares many similarities with James Safechuck's lawsuit and stories. This just gets wilder every single day.